Welcome to John Gets Games. This is a Games Radar vlog where I'll be discussing 29 new games and expansions that I've just learned about over the last few months and that piqued my interest. I will be going through all of these in alphabetical order. Now, I do want to mention that if you'd prefer to listen to this vlog instead of watch it, then you can do so by searching for the John Gets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. I'd also like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel in the creation of videos like this one in the future, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and many of them have perks like uh, watching some videos early and advertisement free, as well as voting on which of those videos are made. All right, I think let's now start talking about these new games, and I will be discussing each of them as I go through the Board Game Geek pages for them. The first one is Caesar with an exclamation point, and the reason this one caught my interest is because it seems like it might be a sequel of sorts to Blitzkrieg, which is also a great game. Uh, now, I say also, I don't know if this is good, but this is a one to two player game that is designed by Paolo Mori and published by PSC Games, which is the same combo that put out Blitzkrieg, which is why I have that suspicion. Right now on Board Game Geek, they don't have any images at all, and the description just says that the Roman Republic is coming to an end, but not before a power struggle between Caesar and Pompey. Players will command their legions, strategically deploying them to key battlegrounds to try and seize control of the provinces and become the ruler of the Republic. Players draw tokens from a bag to determine their starting forces and replenish their losses. Players allocate their resources to each battleground, winning victory points for the resources Sources, special weapons, and strategic advances as they play. Now, if you're not familiar with Blitzkrieg, that sounds a lot like Blitzkrieg, so um, that's yet another reason why it feels like it might be a sequel, and I've really enjoyed Blitzkrieg. So um, if that is what this ends up being, then I'll be even more excited about it, and this is part of the reason why I've subscribed to it on BoardGameGeek, so that I can learn more about it as more information comes out. The next game is old. <laughs> this is Carcassonne the Castle. This came out in 2003, and I just somehow never heard of it before. Uh, this is a Reiner Knizia design, although Reiner Knizia did not design the original game of Carcassonne. Now, the key thing to this is that it's a two-player only game of Carcassonne, and in this game, you are essentially playing Carcassonne. Each person is putting various tiles down onto the board, but the um, area, well, I guess onto the table, but the area where you play these are actually restricted by a uh, strangely uh, meandering victory point track, which is also the walls to the city. Now, or I guess the castle. Uh, now, as you play, you are going to be um, doing a lot of Carcassonne things, placing your meeples down in different ways to score points that are very familiar to Carcassonne. I've read through the rules, but it's been a couple of weeks. Um, but the big thing that jumps out to me is that I love Carcassonne, and I think Carcassonne is a brilliant two-player game, so I am quite curious to try a two-player only version of Carcassonne that was designed by Reiner Knizia, who has made many games that I like. It just seems like there's probably a lot of stuff going on here that is uh, interesting. And one thing in particular, is on this meandering track, there's a bunch of corners, and you put these tiles down, face down onto the corners. And this is a bit of a victory point puzzle, because if you score victory points so that you exactly land on a corner instead of blowing right past it, then you get to take the tile, or maybe there's multiple tiles from that spot. I can't remember specifically, but it has this extra puzzle of not necessarily wanting to get the most victory points you can. Maybe you want to get a couple less to land onto that exact spot to then get that bonus before your opponent is able to do that. And that all sounds neat. So. <laughs> I love Carcassonne, I love two-player Carcassonne, and that just makes me want to try this one at some point in the future. Next up, we have City Builder Ancient World. Uh, I just learned about this one earlier today, actually. Uh, this one went up on Kickstarter uh, last year, and it's just now being fulfilled, and I saw some images of it on Twitter, and my first reaction was, whoa, that game looks cool. Uh, so in this game, you are going to be laying down tiles, and the way these tiles go down is they have different diagonal roads on them, so they are um, square tiles with diagonals on some of them. And as you're playing through the game, you are actually going to be uh, expanding out and putting various uh, different shape things onto those areas, and you're also going to be placing colonists down from these uh, push and pull tracks that are between each of the players. So it has this uh, really neat aesthetic where you have a city being constructed with um, various things that are on a diagonal to each other, and also it has this um, push and pull where you have these tracks of colonists between you and opponents to either side, and the quicker you are able to pull these off and put them down in front of you, the more points you'll get versus versus your opponent who is right next to you. So these all seem like really cool ideas. I like tile laying in general. Each person is making their own tile laying area, and then it has these 
other things that are on top as far as mechanics. So I'm quite intrigued by this one. Um, I somehow just completely um, didn't hear about this at all <laughs> when it first came out onto Kickstarter. And um, the more I looked into it, I watched a video or two, the more I realized this is a game that I think I would really like to try. Next up, we have Divinus, which is a new game coming out by Lucky Duck Games at some point uh, in the future. Well, it says 2022 on BGG, and there is a big description for this game. There is an image of the box cover, but nothing of the actual mechanics of the game. But from what I can tell, well, I guess right there at the top of the description, it says that Divinus is a competitive legacy tiling digital hybrid game in which you will play as a demigod seeking to gain the favor of the gods and to ascend to the new pantheon. Players are going to embark on a 12 scenario campaign that will see them exploring lands, completing quests, interacting with gods, impacting the outcome of the epic clash between Greek and North pantheons. So that's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot going on here. Um, and it's interesting to see a competitive legacy style game. Those don't often happen. And it's also interesting to see a competitive digital hybrid game where you're going to have an app that is going to track the decisions that you've made across the entire campaign, which um, is definitely going to affect, you know, the later things based off of the things you did earlier. Uh, this seems like it's got a bunch of cool stuff going on, and I'm definitely interested in learning more about it. Uh, in particular, maybe seeing a video or two, because um, I think even seeing some photos is not going to do this one justice. Next up, we have an expansion. This is Dual Gauge, Honshu, and Wisconsin Maps. Uh, now, Dual Gauge is a Cube Rails-esque game about um, supply chain route building with trains that I've enjoyed, and I actually put up a Good Games vlog impression of that one a few months ago, if you'd like to learn about it. And I was intrigued by what I saw, and this is the first map expansion to come out. It has two different maps, and I just think they seem super cool. In fact, I purchased this the moment I could, the moment I saw they came out, and I think technically they're already on the way. Um, the big thing with this uh, expansion is that the Honshu map is, well, obviously in Honshu, and mechanically, it's very tight, really restrictive, and there's some other mechanics going on that I don't fully understand because I don't have the game yet, versus the Wisconsin map, which is supposedly wide open and all about being not restricted and doing really big things. And the Wisconsin map is the one I'm most interested in playing, although I'm interested in trying both of these out. I've played the original two maps that came with Dual Gauge already. Those were Detroit and Portugal, and and I found both of them lacking slightly, but I really like the system of dual gauge, which is part of the reason I'm so excited for this, because these, these expansion maps have had, you know, a full year of development, essentially, since the original release of dual gauge. Actually, it hasn't been a year. It's been half a year or something like that. But either way, I'm um, excited to see where the development is and where the new ideas are for these ones. And again, I believe it's in the mail heading over to me now soon. All right, the next game is Evora, which is a 2022 game that it says uh, you are going to be a builder in the Roman Empire. Stone by stone, you are building the Roman uh, Temple of Evora. So there are no images of this game at all on Board Game Geek right now, um, and the description is really what caught me. It says the Roman Temple of Evora is possibly uh, was probably built in the honor of Emperor Augustus in the first century AD, and in this game, players are going to play the role of builders in the Roman Empire, and you're going to take actions building this temple. Uh, now, players move their workers around a rondelle to define the action they intend to perform, which could be building uh, with stones and capitals, improving the columns that are already there in the temple, and requesting the influence of important character cards. And there's the emperor, the governor, the centurion, and the architect, who all seem to care about different parts of the temple. And this is a 30 to 60 minute game for two to four players. And I'm intrigued. I like rondelles in general. I like building stuff, especially competitively with other people building the same thing. And I think that's what's going on here. So I'm quite interested in learning more about this one. Next up, we have Fairy Tale Inn. Uh, now, this one came out recently, and I, I learned about it because of Twitter. Somebody posted a photo of it on Twitter, and it instantly grabbed my attention because my first thought was, hey, is that Connect Four, but with fantasy creatures? And that is exactly what this is, essentially. Uh, you have a big plastic uh, uh, holder that goes between you and your one opponent. This is a two-player only game. And then you are going to be dropping in these little tiles that have different um, uh, 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 images on them like a princess or Jack and the Beanstalk or the Three Little Pigs. And each one of these different tiles scores differently. So you are sliding these down, dropping them down a lot like Connect Four, but it's not necessarily about making a Connect Four. It's all about um, scoring for a wide uh, variety of different conditions. And it's my understanding that the game comes with eight different character tile types that all have um, different ways they score. Uh, sometimes in the middle of the game, sometimes specifically once the game is over. And each time you play the game, you will uh, mix and match so that you'll have different 
groups of them from one uh, game to the next. Um, now, there is a public board where you actually um, take tiles from and you drop them down, and they're gray, uh, or I guess uh, faded out on one side and in color for yours. So not only does the location of the tile matter, but of course when you drop it, you put it facing you so that you know which ones you can score. Now, the plastic grid that you're dropping these into has different special uh, um, uh, icons on it as well, and honestly, this game grabbed my attention so much that I have already ordered a copy. <laughs> just now, like literally 30 minutes ago when I was doing research for this vlog, I was like, you know what? This just seems too cool. I don't know if it's going to be my favorite game ever, but it seems interesting enough, and I found a copy that was a reasonably uh, low enough price that um, I already bit the bullet. So <laughs> I'm going to be getting a copy of this one, uh, hopefully rather soon, because it just looks so intriguing. I played tons of Connect 4 when I was a kid, and the idea that this builds on the back of that um, mechanical system with a bunch of Yuri other stuff really grabs me. Um, one of the designers is Paolo Mori. The other is Remo Kanzadori. Uh, they're not as familiar to me as Paolo Mori, who has done many games I like. Well, I already talked about uh, Blitzkrieg and that Caesar game that I'm excited about as well. Uh, next up, we have Horn of Plenty, and um, <laughs> this is interesting because it's listed as a 2019 game. There are no images of it at all, and the description is quick. It just says, Horn of Plenty is a trick-taking game in which four players win tricks by matching colors on cards and also gain generosity tokens by being nice to other players. And those last few words are the reason why this is on the list. Um, it doesn't seem like it's probably published, which is interesting considering it says 2019, but um, there's no way to get this game. It says self-published. Uh, honestly, I just wanted to talk about this because I like trick-taking games, but they tend to be mean, kind of by definition. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I can certainly lean into that and enjoy it. I just love the idea of a trick-taking game where you gain benefits for being nice to your opponents. Um, so I'd love to learn more, but it seems unlikely to happen, but I'm subscribed to it. I'm the only person subscribed to it on Board Game Geek right now. So maybe at some point something will emerge from it in the future, but probably not. Uh, all right, next up we have Iberian Rails. This one came out in 2017, and I have an interesting story about this one. Uh, the designer of this one is Tony Chen, and he was actually a part of the board gaming group that um, I uh, I first really got into when I was falling in love with board games back in like 2009. Uh, so I played a bunch of in-person games with Tony Chen. Uh, and um, about, I don't know, four years ago, five years ago, something like that, uh, Tony actually reached out to me and said, hey, I'm a designer of board games now and I'm working uh, working with a publisher, Monsoon Publishing, and um, I have this train game that I'd love for you to try. And I said no, very politely, because at the time, I was of the opinion that I didn't like train games, I didn't like stocks in games, and I did not like auctions in games, and this does all three of those. And Tony uh, understood that, he said, you know, I, I understand, like, this is probably not a game that you'll be interested in, and um, that was kind of the end of it. But then, a few months ago, I fell in love with Cube Rails games and suddenly realized I like stocks, and I like auctions, and I like trains. So now I'm kind of re-remembering about Iberian Rails, if that makes sense. Like, I had such a glancing blow with it originally that I never subscribed to it or really paid it any attention. And now I have, and now I actually want to play this game. Uh, it came out, you know, four years ago or so, and there's a bunch of content on it, uh, videos as well as forum posts, and this is just one I'd like to circle back to. Now that I realize it's a kind of game that I'd really like, uh, I just think that could be fun. So uh, hopefully I can make up for the mistake of saying no to this all those years ago. Although, honestly, maybe if he had sent me the copy, I wouldn't have liked it because maybe I was not ready for it or perhaps I would have loved it and realized I like these kinds of games about four years earlier which would have been nice but either way that is Iberian Rails uh, after that we have Ice Flows and Foes which honestly it's on this list <laughs> it could be on this list just for that title I think that's wonderful but the main reason it is is because of the components um, this is a game where you have a circular little cardboard table in the middle and a bunch of different shaped uh, ice pieces, and then you have little animals and little hunter tokens, and the idea of this game is you're going to be pushing these uh, plastic tokens onto this big table, and then other tokens are hypothetically going to fall off. And the idea is you're trying to save all of the animals by getting rid of all the hunters in the boats. So you get points for the boats that you knock off, but if you ever um, push a uh, token in so that an animal falls off, then you actually lose your turn. Um, normally, I think you can push a few things. And that's really the game. Uh, this just has a wonderful aesthetic to it. 
it's a uh, kind of a classic mechanic. Uh, there are lots of uh, like arcade type games that use this sort of thing, and I like the idea of using it in a competitive atmosphere. Obviously, this is going to be a very lightweight game, uh, but it just seems interesting enough. It just jumped out to me, and uh, sometimes on in these games radar vlogs, I just like to highlight games that make me go, huh, that's cool. Uh, that Horn of Plenty I mentioned earlier is on here for that reason, even though that one potentially... Who knows if it'll have, ever actually be published. This one does have a publisher listed, Keep Exploring Games, and it's supposedly a 2021 game. So perhaps uh, that'll come out. Actually, it's listed as a Kickstarter game on the tag. So perhaps this one will have a Kickstarter cam campaign coming out soon. I don't actually know any more than that. All right, next up we have Imperial Steam, and I am super excited about this game because I'm crazy about train games these days. Now, this is being published by Capstone Games, and it's my understanding that this is going to be their big Essen Spiel release later on in the game. And it is a two to four player game, 90 to 120 minutes, and the designer is uh, Alexander Humer, who is the person who designed Lignum, which is a well-liked uh, medium to heavyweight game with kind of a time track shenanigans going on. Uh, now, this is an economic train game with contracts and pick up and deliver. There are no images of it just yet. Uh, and the description over here says that um, the industrial age is starting to boom. You are in need of more workers for your factories, and you also need more workers to build your railroad tracks to expand your railway network. This, in turn, will enable you to deliver your goods from the factories to cities in high demand, but you do not want to forget to earmark goods for fulfilling your profitable contracts. This all sounds very trainy, very capitalisty, very, you know, um, entrepreneurial, all that kind of stuff, which I apparently like in board games uh, now. And so I think the uh, pedigree of the designer and the pedigree of the publisher in particular uh, and my recent uh, uh, strong interest in economic, logistic, and train-style games makes me very interested in finding out more about this. Uh, obviously, there are no details, so it's possible this turns into something um, I'm not ultimately excited about, but for now... I'm quite excited about what this could be, and I think it's very possible it'll turn into a game that I really want to play. All right, the next game is Iron Horse, and this one jumped out to me mostly because it looks like it is a fully cooperative, push-your-luck, dice-rolling game. Uh, it's got a bunch of unique characters, and the theme is that you are all outlaws trying to do a big gold heist, and I have a hard time for, uh, thinking of any other push-your-luck cooperative games. I'm sure they exist. I'm, I'm actually sure I've played one before, but I can't think specifically of what they are, which makes me feel like this is not a very common mixture of mechanics. So that is essentially enough for me to be intrigued by this game. There are no images of what it looks like. Uh, it's uh, listed as a 2022 game, so it might be a while until more information pops up about this one. But yeah, I'm just curious to learn more about how that push your luck uh, works out with the cooperative gameplay experience here. Uh, next up, we have Land vs. Sea, which is a 2021 game. Uh, now, this is listed as a 2-4 to four player game, and man, right away, I was uh, caught up by this game. Uh, it says it's a 40-minute playtime, which is uh, fine for me in general. Uh, I often bounce a little bit off of games that tend to be too much quicker than that, but... The reason I'm intrigued by this is because in this game, you are going to be playing as the land or the sea, and if it's a four-player game, then you have two people as land, two people as sea, or the three-player game is asymmetric, where one person plays a cartographer, and they somehow interact with the other players. Now, in this game, which, um, according to the back of the box, you can learn how to play in only two minutes, um, you are going to be putting these hexagon tiles down that have some water on them and some land on them, and you are, um, if you are the sea player, then you are emphasizing uh, laying these tiles out in such a way that you score best for the sea, and if you're the land player, you're trying to put them down best for the land, so you are competing to build a map in front of you with uh, different interests, and i do not even sure how the cartographer works, but it says it's asymmetric, and that just sounds cool. Uh, this uh, game grabbed me uh, right from the get-go. I love the artistic style, I love hexagons, and I love the idea of this game. So this is one I'm quite interested in trying to play at some point. Um, it seems like the, the box front and box back um, seem very done on Board Game Geek. It's listed as a 2021 game. Uh, I don't think it is available just yet, um, or maybe it's about to be, but either way, this one really grabbed my attention. It looks like not that many people have subscribed to it on Board Game Geek right now, but uh, either way, hopefully I get a chance to try this one at some point. All right, next up we have Lose on Rails, which is a 2021 game, and it's been a few months since I've done one of these games radar vlogs, and this one I actually learned about many months ago, like right after I uh, did the last of these radar vlogs. Now, this is a cube rail style game that I have actually 
technically played already. I, I haven't covered it on my Good Games vlog yet for um, reasons I won't bore you with because I did enjoy the one play of it. Uh, and I enjoyed that one play enough that I already purchased a copy of the game and it's already arrived here. So <laughs> I own a copy of this one. Uh, so a lot has happened since I filmed the last one of these radar vlogs. But the big thing that jumped out to me why I was intrigued by this game, why I enjoyed the game, and why I wanted to buy it so that I can play it more is be, um, in this game you're going to be laying track for various companies like a lot of Cube Rails games, but there are specific spots on the board that are essentially industrial towns and other spots that are ports. And whenever you connect a port, you are going to essentially increase the stock value by the number of industrial towns that you've already connected. So that means if you connect to ports early, then you get a very weak increase to the stock value. But if you wait on the ports and try to get a bunch of these industrial cities, then the port will be much more efficient. But of course, maybe somebody else has gotten there first. And also the bigger your stock value, the stock value is, the more impactful it can be to you in the middle of the game. So do you try to be hyper efficient and maybe wait too long? Or do you just, you know, not worry about that efficiency and try to grab all of this stuff early? Uh, now I'm looking forward to playing this one more with the copy that I own. Um, this game just jumped out to me also from an aesthetic perspective. I think it's a really beautiful uh, overall package. All right, next up we have Maracaibo The Uprising. Now this is an expansion for Maracaibo, and I believe it's the first expansion. And this one, so in general, expansions have to do a lot to get me intrigued. I talked about the Honshu and Wisconsin maps for Dual Gauge earlier, and those just, each of the maps drastically changed the game. And for Maracaibo The Uprising, this one really jumped out to me because it says it has several modules and scenarios, and one of them, which maybe is the big one, says you are going to be pushing the predominant nations out of the Caribbean in competitive and cooperative mode. Now, right there, that is a lot in one sense, because in Maracaibo, you are in the Caribbean, or at least when you're playing the base game, you're in the Caribbean, and the French, the Spanish, and the English are all just placing their cubes all over the place, which is just, you know not great as these Western powers are pushing in. And um, in the original game of Maracaibo, you are buying for influence in these different powers to get points. Now with this expansion, you can competitively, I guess, do the inverse, where I think the cubes will already be on the board and you will push them out and then gain victory points for that, which sounds cool. But then a cooperative mode is going to turn everything on its head because Maracaibo is a competitive game. So just uh, the idea that this expansion is bringing in a cooperative mode is a big deal, but the fact that it's bringing in a cooperative mode that goes along with this uprising where you're pushing out all these nations is really going to change the situation, and I am fascinated by all of this. Um, I like Maracaibo quite a bit. I think it's got some really cool engine building stuff. It's got some uh, really cool sailing around the Caribbean action efficiency type stuff, and the idea of doing this cooperatively, and also inverting the problematic theming that came with the original game. Uh, uh, just has me super intrigued. This is something I would love to learn more about and would love to play. All right, the next game is Messina 1347, and the fact that it is being published by Delicious Games is essentially enough for it to be on this game's radar vlog. Now, Delicious Games is uh, run by Vladimir Suchi and his wife, um, and maybe more people now, I'm not sure. It's only a few years old, and it seems to be the publishing company that puts out Vladimir Suchi's games, and I've really enjoyed essentially all of uh, their games. So this thematically also seems fascinating. So beyond the pedigree of the publisher and designer, uh, I also really love what it's saying here. So it says, Messina 1347 takes place during the introduction of the Black Death Plague and the spreading of its infection through town. During this time period, merchant ships delivering luxury goods to Europe brought them to these countries in an unprecedented epidemic, and one of the first cities was Messina, Italy. So I'm just going to keep reading this description because it's nice and short and tells you a lot about the game. It says, in the game, players take on the role of important Messina families who are leaving town and moving to the countryside out of fear of being infected by the plague. While doing this, they are focusing on saving other inhabitants and helping to fight the uh, plague infection in town. And they must also endeavor to prosper in the countryside residents where they are temporarily accommodating other rescued residents, and you are all waiting for the Black Death to subside so that you can return to Messina. Now, there are images of the box cover as well as the game itself, um, and not a lot of details, I guess, mechanically of how the game works, but there are these hex tiles that are going to be being put together, and I actually found an image on the Delicious Games Twitter that showed a lot more of these hexagons in a really big grid, and um, it seems like most of these hexes have little rats on them, which makes sense because of the Black Death. And um, the game also appears to have some tracks, and I love tracks <laughs> in the Euro games. So this just has everything going for it. Like, also from a theme perspective, 
I mean, not that the Black Death sounds like a fun thing, but from a theming perspective, the idea of being in this port town as the Black Death is starting to sweep over Europe and trying to survive and prosper while also, you know, just doing everything that you can, that sounds pretty cool as far as the setting is concerned. Uh, as far as the mechanics uh, are, it says there's grid movement, uh, a modular board, track movement, variable player powers as well. So there is quite a bit of uh, stuff going on. It looks like there is a Spanish language interview about this one on Board Game Geek, which I don't know Spanish, so I've not watched that one yet. But either way, this one is very high up on my uh, excitement list, I guess, for the year. I believe this one is supposed to be coming out around Essence Beal in a few months as well. So I'm looking forward to learning more about this one and also to playing this one because it feels like, from what I've seen already, I know this is a game I'm going to want and that I'm not going to want to play. All right, next up we have Motor City. Uh, this is a 2022 release, and this is apparently, according to the description, a strategic roll and write game about running an auto plant in the heyday of Detroit. Uh, now, there are no images um, for this game right now, but there's a decent sized description. And mechanically, it says it has action drafting, dice rolling, paper and pencil, and also solitaire. Uh, I did read through this description, and I don't think I'll read through it right now, but it seems like it's the kind of game where you roll dice and then you actually draft those dice um, in order around the table. So you take the die and you put it in front of you so that no one else can use it. And then there will be one die uh, not picked by any of the players in each of the rounds, and every player actually gets access to that die. So you have dice that you draft that only you have, and then everyone can share that one die in the middle, which sounds like a pretty cool take on dice drafting in general. I like roll and writes, and I think a strategic roll and write game sounds cool. I like that dice drafting system. So this is a game I'm looking forward to learning more about. All right, next up we have Neoville, which is a 2021 release. Um, this one just popped up, um, I think, uh, a few days ago on Board Game Geek. And the main reason I'm paying attention to it is because the designer is Phil Walker Harding, who has made several games I really like. In particular, Baron Park is one that I really, really like. Um, now, this says that Neoville is looking for architects to build a city that is a combination of human habitation and the natural world. Uh, in this game, you are going to be placing tiles out into a 4 by 4 city grid, building up skyscrapers that give you harmony points. And, you know, it seems like it's a tile lane game where you're building on a four by four grid. Um, there is a nice image of the box cover, but no images of what the game looks like. So I don't know if it actually stacks three dimensionally or if they are just thematically skyscrapers. Um, it doesn't even have a uh, playtime listed on, uh, actually on the box. It does say, I think, 30 to 45 minutes. So that tells you a little bit about the overall weight of the game. Um, yeah, I, I like the designer. I think the box art looks nice. I think there's a possibility this is a game I like to play. I wouldn't say I'm super excited by the description, but I'm definitely uh, interested. Uh, my, my interest has been piqued. So I'm sure we'll learn more about that one soon. All right, next up we have an expansion. Uh, it's Railroad Inc. Challenge epic board. Now, I totally missed the fact that there was a Railroad Inc. Uh, Kickstarter that came out last year. In the last game's radar vlog, I believe I talked about a whole bunch of the Railroad Inc. challenges and mini expansions and all that. Um, or maybe it was a couple uh, vlogs ago. But um, I've subsequently realized all of that stuff came in a massive Kickstarter that um, was on Kickstarter, I think, a year or so ago. And I just completely missed this. Um, I really like Railroad Inc., so I think it's probable I would have gone in for some form of that Kickstarter. But one part of that Kickstarter were these epic boards. Um, now, in Railroad Inc., you have, I believe, a 7x7 seven seven grid, or maybe it's a little bit bigger than that, where you are drawing your little railroad lines, and these epic boards are gigantic. They are, it looks like, 11 uh, wide and tall, and maybe the same for each of these two boards, maybe a little bit less for them. But either way, they're just gigantic boards that you're going to play on, which makes it so that you can have epic games of Railroad Inc., I really like Railroad Inc. I think the idea of a board that has a bunch of pre-seeded uh, um, things on it, like things that are drawn on, probably some restrictions, and just allowing you to have a massive network at the end of the game sounds cool. Unfortunately, I have no idea if this can be acquired solo. Uh, I know it was part of the Kickstarter campaign. I, I, I really feel like I would have backed it just to get these epic boards if I had realized there was a Kickstarter campaign happening. Uh, so maybe at some point in the future I'll have the opportunity to uh, acquire these or at least play a game on them because that seems like a really fun way to play Railroad Inc. 
All right, next up we have Rat Queens to the Slaughter. Uh, now, I first learned about this one actually because Deep Water Games reached out to me about making a sponsored tutorial video for this, and I said yes. So I will be learning a lot more about this game very soon because hypothetically, I think that video is supposed to come out in a few weeks. I don't actually have the uh, copy of the game just yet, but um, this is a cooperative deck construction uh, dice rolling game that is set on a an IP, I think, for comics. Uh, the Board Game Geek page does not have any images of this one yet, um, and I do believe it's going to be going on Kickstarter for the video that I'm making. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a Kickstarter thing. Um, now, in the description, it says that you are going to be um, essentially spending half of your game defeating monsters cooperatively to build up your deck to get stronger, and then I think there is... Actually, it doesn't quite say what you do with the second half of the game in this description, but it says that combat is a simplified version of RPG combat with easy-to-learn dice checks and attacks and abilities. It's a 45 to 60 minute game, so it's probably not um, a super heavy weight experience overall. And, uh, oh, one of the designers is uh, Sen Fung Lim, who's definitely done some stuff I've heard about, and Deep Water Games has put out a whole bunch of good games. So yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more about this one because I will be as part of my job <laughs> because I am making a sponsored tutorial for this one. All right, next up we have Rift Force. Uh, now this one has a whole bunch of videos on it from like nine months ago or so. And uh, I first heard about it just a few weeks ago because Capstone Games announced that they are going to be publishing it, I guess for the United States. Um, the original publisher is One More Time Games and maybe they're handling another part of the world. I'm not really sure, but I know that Capstone Games is a part of it now. Uh, now this is a two player only game, which you know I have talked about at least one of those already in this vlog, but oftentimes a game needs to be particularly interesting to grab my attention for a two-player setting. And this one certainly does seem interesting. Uh, in this game, um, you are going against one other opponent and there are all these different elementals. And when you play the game, you're going to be uh, getting a mixture of four of the different elementals that come in the game. Uh, I think there's like 10 and each of you takes four. And then you use this mixture of these different elemental effects to then also make a deck that you shuffle together with the elements of those colors, and then you are doing a kind of battle line type game, or I guess majority type game, where you're putting cards on one side, on your side, and your opponent put cards on their other side, and you can play these cards down, or you can discard them to activate the cards that are already down, to then use the ability of those specific elementals for that type of color. And apparently the way these can interact can be quite fascinating. I've, I've heard some good things about it, there's a bunch of videos about it on Board Game Geek already, and that just seems cool. Like, the big thing that's grabbing me about this is the idea that each time you play the game, you are going to have drastically different combos and stuff that can be put together with the uh, various types of elements that you can have. Um, it's a quick one, 20 to 30 minutes, so it seems like the kind of thing that could be fun to play multiple times, um, you know, shuffling things back up again and trying different combinations. And yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure why this one popped up as much because, you know, uh, games of this weight, player count, um, time length is not generally the thing I gravitate towards that much, especially like combative games like this, but um, this one's calling to me. And at some point in the future, I am hoping to have a chance to try this one out. All right, next up we have Savannah Park, which is also being published by Capstone Games and a few other publishers like Deep Print Games. Um, now this is the latest uh, Kiesling and Kramer game, and this one seems pretty cool. I mean, honestly, it would most likely be on my list just for being a Capstone release and also a Kramer and Kiesling. Both of those things are positives in my mind in general. And in this game, each player has their own Savannah Park in front of them, which has, I think, something like 30 different animal tokens on it. Uh, now in the game, uh, on your turn, you're going to call out a single type of token, and then every player has to move that token and then flip it face down, and um, the spot that it moves to, I believe, will not move for the rest of the game. So as soon as it's flipped over, that is static. So I believe you're going to go through the game, um, eventually moving every single one of these tokens, and then once every token has been flipped to the red side, the game is over, and then you score up based off of how these animals are adjacent to other animals of that same type. Apparently there are brush fires which can actually wipe out some animals based off different conditions. And all of this just seems like a cool little puzzle where um, players are, uh, they have agency, they, you know, on your turn, you get to decide what animal is going to move and then everybody moves. So that means it's the kind of game where everyone is taking a turn at the same time. And occasionally you have more control about what happens. And that sounds cool. I think this idea of having a board that has a bunch of tokens on it that you are just moving 
back and forth, essentially just hopping from one empty spot to another, because when you move a tile, obviously you make a new vacancy. That seems like there could be some really cool puzzly aspects to it where you um, are trying to, you know, make these vacancies work out for other different combinations. Uh, so yeah, I'm intrigued by this one. Um, I might have uh, overly skimmed over the rules. I just was looking at the description of it. I haven't seen an actual in-depth thing about the rules for this one, but I'm hoping to have an opportunity to try this one at some point. Uh, I have a good relationship with Capstone Games. I've actually covered a few of them with sponsored tutorials. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to end up doing a sponsored one for this one or Rift Force. I certainly wouldn't mind it, though. And either way, I, I am looking forward to trying this one because it seems like something I'd quite enjoy. It is a 20 to 40 minute game, so it does seem rather quick. Like I said, you're just, you know, taking the tile, flipping it over and placing it down. And once you're all done with that, you just score it up. But it seems like there could be some pretty cool decisions inside this 20 to 40 minute game. All right, next up we have Sleeping Gods. <laughs> now, this is the uh, latest game, or one of the most latest games, from Red Raven Games, who have been putting out games for a decade. And if I'm being honest, um, I was really excited about those games, like a decade ago, uh, with like Empires of the Void 1 and 8 Minute Empire and uh, Above and Below and those games. Um, and I played all of those, actually. And it always seemed like, um, for Red Raven Games, um, I liked them, but they didn't quite grab me as much as I wanted to. And for some reason or another, as the years went on and more Kickstarters came out, um, I just gave it less attention as time went on, which is interesting because those other games were, were um, they, they varied from fine to, you know, me quite enjoying them. I do remember being disappointed by Empires of the Void 1, um, but I do also love the artistic style, and uh, Ryan Lockett is the designer and artist for all of these games, and um, I remember when Sleeping Gods came out on Kickstarter, I gave it essentially no thought because I heard, oh, it's a lot like Seventh Continent, and it's a Red Raven game, and Seventh Continent, I know, was very ambitious, but a lot of people bounced off of it, and um, again, like I, for some reason, there's just so many games coming out, I just haven't paid as much attention to these Red Raven ones. Uh, now, this game has shipped out, and I watched the no pun included review of it, and now I realize this is a game I desperately want to play. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the details of it. Honestly, you should watch the No Pun Included review. It's excellent. Um, and I just realized this is, in particular, a game that I would really enjoy playing with a certain um, subset of my group. It's a campaign-style game, and I've already reached out to those friends and said, hey, would you want to play this with us? And they said yes. So I'm now hoping to get a copy of this game so that I can play through a campaign of it uh, with these friends. Um, it seems like uh, the, the reason I, I went to these specific friends is because I have a long history of um, playing like Tales of the Arabian Nights with these people. And um, these people also really like role-playing games. And this is definitely a board game, but it has, from what I understand, a lot of decision moments where you can, you know, the story things where, you know, do this or that, and then something happens based off of it. And I've just heard so many glowing things. It just seems like something I'd like to jump on. So I'm regretting not giving it more attention and uh, maybe not uh, believing in it more when I first heard about it and gave it very little thought. Um, and now it's incredibly expensive. <laughs> Supposedly, there's going to be a new print run coming out soon. Um, so I'm probably going to be waiting for that instead of spending hundreds of dollars for this game. But I am actively looking forward to giving this one a shot. I think it's going to be a really great time. All right, the next game is 10. Uh, now, this one honestly jumped out to me because sometimes simple card games have a really wonderful allure. And um, this game seems like it might be one of those. It says that this is an exciting push your luck auction game for the whole family where you draw cards and you try not to bust. There's also auctions, which I don't fully understand. Um, there is an image of the back of the box on Board Game Geek, which seems to kind of teach the rules. And on your turn, you are drawing cards from a deck. And if you draw cards to the point where you um, draw more than 10 value, I think, then you bust and you lose your turn. And when certain cards come out, there's actually going to be an auction where players can spend currency to take those cards. I think they're wild. And you're trying to make the longest sets of these different uh, color types. Um, I don't fully understand the game. I think it needs a little bit more rules than what it shows in the back. Obviously, the back is just to get your interest, and I am certainly interested. Um, there are uh, times where, uh, specifically um, when we travel to see family, um, where we play played simple um, card games that seem to work really well, and this seems like it could be one of those games that could be fun to play in one of those circumstances. So this is one um, I might try to seek out a copy of. It's um, It seems like it's probably a relatively small box, so it's probably not going to be terribly expensive. Um, I might um, uh, take a chance on this one. It's entirely possible that the uh, gimmick of this game turns into an experience that's just fine and not actually all that gripping, but it's something I'd like to give a shot at some point. All right, next up we have Terra Futura, and this one um, has a box cover image on BoardGameGeek and a decent-sized description, but uh, no other images of what the game looks like. 
the main reason this one is on the list is because of the first sentence. <laughs> it says, Terra Futura is an engine building card game in which you build your land of tomorrow. Um, that alone, that, that right there, I like engine building card games. And also when I read down on the description even more, it looks like you are building a three by three grid. And specifically when you add these cards down, you're going to be activating other cards in the same row or column. And it doesn't really explain how this works, but apparently there is a speed element to this game where you can produce things quickly and make pollution, which is bad and will clog up your system. Or you can go slowly and cleanly, but maybe, you know, that's going to have other penalties because obviously if you always wanted to do that, then you wouldn't take the pollution. So this seems like it's got some cool stuff going on. It's got network and route building. Um, it's got card laying, it's got engine building. All that stuff seems pretty great. Um, I'm not familiar with the designer or the publisher, but I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about this one, maybe seeing a video or two pop up on Board Game Geek, hopefully. All right, next up we have The Hunger. And this one says, A Vampire Press Your Luck Deck Builder by Richard Garfield. And Richard Garfield is the main reason why this jumped out to me. Also, it's by Renegade Game Studios, they're the publisher, and they've made quite a bit of good stuff in the past. Now, Richard Garfield, um, obviously, is the designer of Magic the Gathering and um, uh, King of Tokyo and uh, many other games that I'm not going to try to rattle off right now. Um, I've enjoyed some of his games more than others. I was obsessed with Magic the Gathering when I was in high school a couple of decades ago. But this game does seem cool on its own merits because... It says that this is a race game where you are trying to optimize your deck essentially before the sun comes up. Uh, uh, the more you are hunting for people, <laughs> you are going to slow down your deck and it makes you harder to get back home before daybreak, at which point you burst into ashes if the sun rises. So you have this push your luck element where you are optimizing your deck, you're getting victory points in the uh, humans that you hunt down, but you might, you know, be too greedy and slow your deck down to the point where you can't actually make it to the end. Um, and the players who all make it back to the castle before the sun rises um, count up their points and whoever has the most points wins. And that seems neat. It's also a 60 minute game. And I feel like just reading that description, I was expecting it to be maybe less than that, make maybe more of a 45 minute game or a 30 minute game. So um, I'm quite intrigued to see how this all works. I think the idea of a game long push your luck system because uh, is, is pretty interesting. Um, oftentimes push your luck means on your turn, you're pushing your luck. And if you push too much, then you're going to bust. But the entire game is one constant push your luck thing of trying to, you know, not uh, uh, glut your deck too much. And I think that could turn out to be pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to learning more about this one. At the moment, there are no images, but with Renegade Game Studios being the publisher, I'm sure this page will be fleshed out with a ton of information, images, and videos at some point relatively soon. It is listed as a 2021 game, um, and we're already halfway through the year, so I imagine there'll be some stuff on here soon. All right, next up we have Unconscious Mind. Um, this one is, uh, well, it jumped out to me largely because of the uh, theme. Um, it's all about uh, a Euro game, a worker placement style game with um, Sigmund Freud and um, the origins of kind of that type of psychology about a hundred years ago. And I'm not going to say that I'm like a, a fan of Sigmund Freud, but I think as far as a, uh, a theming uh, is concerned, that seems like a pretty cool area to uh, try out. Um, there's a pretty decent sized description of this one uh, on BGG, but I think right here in the middle it says that uh, you are a member of this society and your goal is to master the therapeutic techniques and you're doing this uh, with worker placements. You're trying to grow your clientele, you're trying to delve into their dreams, their unconscious minds, which is obviously the name of the game, and you're trying to help them recover from their complexes. And um, I think if you heal them, they leave and that's good because it leaves more spots for you to get more people. At the moment, there is an image of the box cover, but there are no images of what the game actually looks like. Um, the box cover is uh, really beautiful. Like it's a, I really like the artistic style of this one. Um, so yeah, looking forward to uh, learning more about this. It seems like a game I could really like. Uh, oh, the artists are Andrew Bosley and Vincent Dutrait. They've both des uh, uh, done art for some very good looking games. So it would not surprise me if this one turns out to be uh, a really good looking game. And hopefully it's a game that's also fun mechanically. Okay, next up we have Valor and Villainy, Ludwig's Labyrinth. Uh, now, I just learned about this one a week or two ago because uh, Skybound Games reached out to me about making a sponsored tutorial for it. So that's happening, <laughs> and I'm going to be learning a lot more about this one as time goes on. There's a decent amount on BGG already. There's 15 images, uh, and I guess not a very large description, but um, this description tells you a lot, realistically all you need to know. It says that this is a one to six player cooperative adventure where a band of noble heroes from the Order Without Borders are pursuing the mad imp Ludwig in its terrible labyrinth to quell the threat of a demonic invasion. 
Uh, it's a both standalone cooperative game and it's fully cross-compatible uh, sequel to Valor and Villainy, Minions of Mordak. Now, um, Minions of, of Mordak is a... Uh, a game I did make a sponsored tutorial for, and that is also a one versus many game, where one player is always playing Mordak, and everyone else is a band of heroes trying to essentially defeat that Mordak player. So this one is quite interesting to me because it's a sequel. The art directly matches with the other one. A lot of the mechanics are also very similar. Um, I've actually um, been told a decent amount of the mechanics behind the scenes on Tabletop Simulator, so I know quite a bit more about it, but I'm not sure how much I can say at this moment. But I will say that a lot of the mechanics um, are, are straight out of Valor and Villainy, but this one is fully cooperative, and this one does, I think, have a little bit more going on. Um, so I'll be learning a lot more about this one soon. I actually have a copy of this one in this room. It's across the room on my bookshelf, and I'm hoping to start working on this project in a week or so. Um, so a lot more information for everybody is going to be out there soon, uh, and for me in particular when I actually open up that box and really dig into it even more. Um, I thought that Valor and Villainy Minions of Mordak was a cool game. I've actually not played it yet, but I still have the copy here because uh, that's what I've been saving for, you know, once the pandemic gets to the point where I can play games with people here in the house, I wanted to try it. There is a tabletop simulator version, but this seemed like a game I wanted to try in person. Um, so I liked the original enough to want to give it a shot, and I'm uh, quite intrigued to uh, dig into this one even more. I think it's going to have a lot more of that uh, cool stuff going on. And again, it's fully cooperative, so you don't even have to have one player being a kind of enemy versus everybody else. And I think I often prefer fully cooperative experiences compared to one versus many. Sometimes one versus many can bring in some odd dynamics, which I don't know if Minions of Mornak has because I haven't actually played it yet, but I am hoping to at some point. All right, we have reached the last game I'll be talking about, and that is Voidfall. Uh, now, this is, as far as hype is concerned, probably the most hyped game that I've talked about, at least as far as uh, a game that hasn't been released just yet. It's a 2022 release, and it's being published by Mind Clash Games, and the artist is Ian O'Toole, with the designers Nigel Buckley and David Turchie. Now, this is... If we look down here into this rather, rather large uh, description, uh, it's a space 4X game that brings the genre to Euro enthusiast tables. Uh, now that's, I think, a big reason why so many people are quite excited about it. And honestly, it's the reason why it's on here. Um, I've enjoyed 4X games in the past, but I generally prefer the more Euro-y X's <laughs> than the uh, troops on a map type X's. Um, and this one, you know, apparently has you in space. You have uh, minimum luck gameplay with an economic Euro, resource management type decisions. Um, it also apparently has a cooperative solo mode. So it's got quite a bit going on and a competitive mode. Right now, they realistically just have an image of the box cover, but uh, Mind Clash Games tends to put out very expansive component and mechanic rich games. Um, and I've actually only played Anachrony, I think. I think that's the only Mind Clash game that I played. And I, I did enjoy that game. Um, and I've been um, mildly interested in trying some of the other ones, although they have so many things going on that I sometimes feel like, you know, maybe I'll play something else that doesn't have quite that many components and quite that many rules. But um, either way, I think this one is intriguing enough for me to give it a shot. Um, the art looks great from the box cover. The uh, designer pedigree is there. The publisher pedigree is there. And, you know, the only other Euro-style 4X game I can think about is Eclipse. And that is a game that I recently purchased this second edition of, and I played the first edition well over 10 times. So I'm pretty well positioned to enjoy this game. And hopefully that ends up happening. Hopefully uh, this is one I do get to try. Uh, and I'm certainly looking forward to learning more about it. Um, I'm sure there will be a ton of information put up on a board game geek about this one um, as time goes on. All right. Well, that has brought us to the end of these 29 games and expansions. Um, there were well over 2,000 entries that I went through to hone down to these nine. Um, it's been, I think, about two and a half months since I've done one of these. So it'll likely be another, you know, six to eight weeks until I put another one out. And I suppose the last thing I should say is if you think I missed something that I should pay attention to, then feel free to comment about it down below. And um, uh, yeah, maybe it's something I passed over accidentally or passed over for a variety of reasons. But I always like learning about new games. And this is just another way for me to do that. All right. I think that is going to bring this vlog to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.